what to make of Mark Few's comments at Media Day, who will start at the three for Gonzaga, and more questions about the Big 12 on today's mailbag edition of the Locked On Zags podcast. You are Locked On Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to bring you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use promo code Locked On College, and you will get twenty dollars off your first purchase. Folks, it is Mailbag Monday, one of the last Mailbag Mondays before we get to the actual college basketball season for Gonzaga. We got a ton of fantastic questions to get through today. Again, a reminder for those of you who want to get involved in Mailbag Monday, you can join our Discord channel. There is a link in the show notes here, whether you're on a podcast platform or on YouTube. It's free to join. We're talking Zags 24-7 on that Discord channel. We'll have game watches as well. You can also email me, andypatton013 at gmail.com. You can also reach out to me on Twitter, andypattoncbb. I post a tweet on Sunday morning soliciting questions. You can respond to that and get yourself into the show. All right, let's get straight into it today. Like I said, a lot of fantastic questions. This first one here comes from Heartland Zag on Discord, who says, were there any comments Mark Few or the players made during media day that stood out to you? No, like honestly, not really. I, it was pretty boilerplate stuff. Uh, Mark Few tends to not be particularly uh, controversial with the comments that he makes. He, he's he's very kind of subdued and tends to to not really say anything inflammatory or anything that would generate a lot of content. I'm sure our, our friends who who cover this team daily are, are quite used to that uh, and perhaps a little frustrated by that. Um, you know, Mark Few commented, he, the, probably the most, I think, exciting thing that he said is that he said Ryan Nembhard is the best point guard in college basketball. He has said that before. He doesn't typically say things that uh, – with that amount of gusto around them. I uh, certainly, there are a lot of great point guards in college basketball, Tyler Kolek at Marquette, Dewan Harris at Kansas come to mind, but Nemhart is absolutely in that conversation. And, and I think that's an exciting thing that he said. He mentioned they're still taking it easy with Graham EK. They expect him to start the season on time. That's not new news from what we'd heard post craziness. Uh, he also didn't really have any comment about being picked second in the WCC basically said preseason polls don't matter, which is consistently what he has said in the past about this topic. So really wasn't a whole lot from the media days that that was new to us or, or particularly surprising from Mark Few or any of the players, which is because they kind of play that stuff fairly close to the chest. So not not a I'm not surprised that we weren't surprised by anything said at Media Day. Let's put it that way. Next question here comes from Samuel via a Twitter DM. He says, what do you make of Adam Morrison saying that Braden Huff could very well be starting on the new Sack and Jack pod? Yeah, so I think it's unlikely still. But I've been wrong before. I think it's important to acknowledge that. Uh, I don't remember seeing Mark Few and the Zags push a player like this from red shirt all the way into the starting lineup. He would be surpassing Ben Gregg, who was clearly ahead of him on the depth chart last year. He would have to surpass Graham E.K. To be honest, if Graham E.K. is healthy, I think there's almost no way that Braden Huff starts because I don't think you start Braden Huff over Graham E.K. I don't think you start Braden Huff, Graham E.K., and Anton Watson. Watson's not coming off the bench, so I just don't think it works. If E.K. is hurt or if he gets hurt or if he misses time, I think it's possible that Braden Huff steps over Ben Gregg in that situation because he offers a little bit more size because perhaps Gonzaga would want to keep Ben Gregg in the same role coming off the bench. That wouldn't surprise me, but Braden Huff starting over Graham EK, I, I just don't see it. I think Braden Huff's very talented. I think we've seen a lot of growth from him last from last year to this year. I think he's going to perhaps have a bigger role even than I've been projecting. I wouldn't be surprised if I'm wrong about that but I don't see him starting. It just doesn't, it doesn't feel to me like something, it would be very opposite of how Mark Few has historically run this team. And I'd be surprised to see that kind of change unless it's really, really warranted. Next question here comes from Mark at Can Eyeball on Twitter, who says, can you give me your percent odds on who starts at the three for each of Venters, Stromer, Krinovich, 
Yo, and maybe Watson. And can you give the strongest case for each of them in the starting lineup? Yeah, I love percentage questions. Happy to do this one here. So uh, I haven't wavered much on my opinion here, and I still it, it still is not different for me. I'm giving Steel Venters 80% chance of starting at the three for Gonzaga. Beyond that, I have June Sok Yo next at 12%, Dusty Stromer next at 6%, and I gave each of Krinovich and Watson a 1% chance. Reasoning is fairly simple. Few almost never starts true freshmen especially not over veterans. He just doesn't do it. I've said it on the show a few times and I'll say it again. There are exceptions, Jalen Suggs, Chet Holmgren, but for the, Corey Kispert is, is perhaps the most notable recent example of somebody who wasn't a top five, top 10 caliber prospect, but it's rare. And Gonzaga didn't bring Steel Venters in here to replace him with the freshman in the starting lineup. They just didn't. And I think Steele gets a little bit underappreciated by the fan base. People are excited about Dusty Stromer. They're excited about Jun Sakio. I get it. I'm excited about those guys as well. I know Steele doesn't seem very exciting, but I think he's a really good fit for this starting lineup. Again, we're talking about a guy who's Big Sky Player of the Year last year. Best guy in a pretty decent basketball conference. Steele Ventures is not a pushover. He's not somebody who can't hack it at this level. He's not somebody who's going to get replaced by a four-star freshman. I just don't think it's going to happen. And Venters, obviously, is a great shooter. And I think that that is what Gonzaga really wants in that starting lineup. It gives them floor spacing to allow Nembhard and EK to operate more in that pick and roll. The side described ball screen actions work better if one of the opposing team's defenders has to stay close to the perimeter. Or if they don't, Steele gets a wide open three. That's pretty much automatic. I think his fit is better in the starting lineup. Dusty Stromer would have to be an elite defensive player, and most freshmen aren't. Most freshmen who are 6'6 and very skinny don't come in and play elite defense right away. Does that mean Dusty's not going to be a good defensive player at all? No, of course not. I just don't think that what he would need to be to be in the starting lineup over Steele, I just I have a hard time seeing that happening, and Mark Few hasn't made this kind of move historically, and I don't think he will in the situation. Perhaps if Yo really pops really looks good. He's a matchup nightmare. So I could see that happening for him, but I don't see Dusty stepping into that role as a starter. I think he'll have a valuable role off the bench. Same with Yo, but I think Steele's the guy. As far as Krinovich, he's not big enough. I don't think you start Hickman, Nemhard, and Krinovich. If Krinovich does start, it would be a surprise to me, but it would be in place of Nolan Hickman. Uh, and Anton Watson, I don't see them running jumbo lineups. They didn't run jumbo lineups when they had DeMontis Sabonis, Kyle Wilcher, and Shemek Karnowski. They're not going to run jumbo lineups with Graham E.K., Ben Gregg, and Anton Watson, or Braden Huff. Any, any combination of those four guys, I don't think you'll ever see three of them on the floor at the same time. Maybe, maybe occasionally, but not consistently. Next question here comes from Hartland Zag on Twitter, second one of the show for him. He says, what are your best and worst case scenarios for our secret scrimmage against Baylor? Honestly, injuries. <laughs> That's about it. For those who missed it, it, there is a report that Gonzaga and Baylor are going to play each other in a secret scrimmage. We do not know when or where. That is the secret part of secret scrimmage. But honestly, somebody getting hurt is the worst case scenario. There is not any other worst case scenario. Losing by 40 doesn't matter. Losing by 25, losing by a last second bucket, uh, guys shooting really poorly, none of that really matters because there's a lot more that go into secret scrimmages than the results. Mark Few's trying things. Scott Drew's trying things. Maybe they're trying a zone defense. Maybe they're trying a different offensive set. Maybe they're they're mixing lineups that they're not planning to use in the regular season. Like there's so much that, and we won't know any of this. So it's hard for, we, we won't glean any information. There are some potential best case scenarios. If we come out of this and Graham E.K., who I would be shocked if he even plays at all, but if for some reason E.K. plays and scores 25 points against Baylor, like, okay, that's probably a great sign. If Jun song Kyo comes in and puts up a double-double against the Bears, like, yeah, there are some things that could come out of this if we get results that would be promising, but I'm not going to take any of it particularly seriously good or bad because if E.K. scores 25 points, but Baylor wasn't playing their three starting front court players, you know, like it just doesn't matter all that much. So I, 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 Secret Scrimmage is great. It's good for Gonzaga. It's good for Baylor. It's a smart thing for them to be doing. I'm happy it's on the calendar uh, reportedly, but I'm not going to take anything we hear out of that as being particularly good or particularly bad, of course, with the exception being an injury. Well, who is the best athlete on this team and what former Gonzaga teams most resemble this one? All that's coming up. But first... Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. 
And folks, my wife and I are always looking to go to local plays or local sporting events. But with our work schedules, we kind of have to do things really last minute. And that's why we use game time. I know they're going to have the tickets I need. They're going to have them at a good price. And I'm going to be able to see what the view looks like from my seat right there in the app. Game time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for any event that you're looking for, whether it's football, basketball, baseball, music, comedy, theater, whatever, you name it, they've got it. In addition to the view from your seat feature, I also really like the lowest price guarantee and event cancellation protection. Again, this is really valuable for me and my wife and our constantly changing work schedules that we have. It makes me feel comfortable to go ahead and buy the, the any tickets I want. You can take the guesswork out of buying tickets with game time. So download the Game Time app now, create an account, and use promo code Locked On College, and you'll get twenty dollars off your first purchase. Now terms do apply, but again, create an account, redeem code Locked On College for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices, guarantee. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is also brought to you by Prize Picks, folks. Prize Picks right now offers weekly promotions that can lead to big payouts. They have a Taco Tuesday promotion where each Tuesday, Prize Picks discounts select player projections up to 25% to provide you with even more value. With the Prize Picks reboot policy, your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured for NFL games and college football top 25 matchups. If you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. This is unprecedented in the daily fantasy sports platform. It is the only platform that offers this kind of insurance. This app is super easy to use, folks. You just pick two or more players, choose more or less with the given stat. Drake May's passing yards for this week, 222, 225.5. You think he's going to hit that? Absolutely. So go to prizepicks.com slash college. Use the promo code Lockdown College for a first deposit match of up to $100. Again, that's prizepicks.com slash college. Use promo code Lockdown College for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize picks, daily fantasy sports made easy. Folks, I want to thank all of you for making Locked On Zags your first listen or your first watch of the day. Shout out to those everyday listeners checking out the show on YouTube. Shout out to those of you who have already joined the Discord channel as well. We had a great conversation the last couple of days about Ryan Nimpard. We've been talking conference realignment, all sorts of good stuff going on in that Discord channel, including a lot of these mailbag questions, including this one here from Meds Mercer on Discord, who says, who is the most athletic Zag on this team and of all time? Well, I don't think I've seen enough of this team to make that determination. I'm going to say Anton Watson because Anton Watson has a unique blend of size. He is very strong. He is a good leaper. He is a high level athlete in kind of the not jaw dropping, going to win a dunk contest kind of way, but he's a good athlete in terms of he has really quick feet, active hands, good strength, good size. He's also got good leaping ability. Right now, nobody I've seen is definitively a better athlete than he is. I think Jun Sok Yo absolutely could be. We just haven't seen enough of him. And then in terms of all time, there's two that always come to mind. Dimitri Goodson and Ira Brown. Dimitri Goodson, of course, one of the fastest guards in Gonzaga history. Absolute lightning up and down the floor in his couple of seasons running the point for the Zags. He then transferred to Baylor and became an uh, all-league cornerback and got selected in the sixth round of the NFL draft. Anytime a player can be one of the best athletes on the floor for Gonzaga and can also be a professional football player, it's hard to not put them in that elite athlete conversation. Ira Brown comes up as well. His dunking ability was unreal when he was at Gonzaga. He never really got a lot of playing time again. It's the reason Free Ira Brown is a popular Gonzaga podcast because that was a popular phrase at the time of Ira Brown's uh, couple years in Spokane. But this is a guy who was also a minor league baseball player for many years. This is a guy who has been an Olympian with Japan in their three-on-three. He's still playing professional basketball into his 40s. Those two guys really stand out to me among elite athletes who have played basketball for Gonzaga. Jalen Suggs, Chet Holmgren, absolutely in the mix. I think Hunter Salas is in the mix as well. But uh, for me, the conversation starts with Meech and Ira Brown. Next question here comes from Patrick Hall on Discord, who says, if you could insert one NBA Zag, who could still have eligibility onto this roster? Who would it be? Love this question. Get a variation of this question probably every other week on mailbag, but it's always fun. Uh, And every roster, every year, it's a little bit different. For example, this year, if I was picking a a NBA Zag to put back on Gonzaga's roster, I'm going with Jalen Suggs. I don't think that's a particularly controversial take. I do think some people would would look at DeMontis Sabonis, who's literally an all NBA player. Uh, They might look at Chet Holmgren or Brandon Clark, and, and there's arguments for all four of them. I'm taking Suggs because I think guard depth and defense 
are the biggest weaknesses on Gonzaga's roster. I also think rim protection is a huge weakness, which is why the case for either Chet Holmgren or Brandon Clark is significant. Very easy to argue for both those players. I would argue for both of them over Sabonis. Again, not because DeMontis is not because of anything about DeMontis. He's fantastic. I just think that the needs on this roster are more prevalent. You put Jalen Suggs on this team, you start him alongside Ryan Nembhard, you bring Hickman off the bench, suddenly you have a lot more guard depth. You have some a secondary creator who can attack the rim. Ryan and Jalen would be a phenomenal backcourt, similar to the way Jalen and Andrew was, and you get much better defensively. Again, Chet makes a ton of sense as well, but I'd rather bolster the guard depth, and that means Jalen's the guy I'm taking for this exercise. Next question here comes from Grand Chef Otto on Discord, who says... If you had to pick the best, or excuse me, the past lineup that's most similar to the one we have this year, which would it be? So basically picking a former Gonzaga team that most resembles this team is, is the way I'm understanding and interpreting this question. I don't think people are going to love this answer, but I'm going to go with it anyway. It's the 2015-2016 Gonzaga team. Uh, this is the team that uh, lost eight games, that lost to Portland and a handful of other uh, teams in the WCC that had to win against St. Mary's in the NCAA, or in the WCC tournament uh, in order to make the, the big dance. Eric McClellan dropped 22 in that game. Uh, the Zags advanced the uh, NCAA tournament, beat Seton Hall in the first round, smashed Utah in the second round, ended up losing to Syracuse in the Sweet 16. The reasons that I think these teams are similar, for one, that team returned about 53% of their scoring not too dissimilar from Gonzaga's team this year. Uh, the 15-16 team was the first year post Pangos and Bell. This year's team loses Rasir Bolton and Malachi Smith, two veteran guards as well. Obviously not four-year starters, but still somewhat similar. Uh, that team had an injury-prone starting center in Shemek Karnowski, of course. The Zags have Graham E.K. That team started a transfer guard and a sophomore guard in Eric McClellan and Silas Melson. This year's team starts a transfer guard in Ryan Nemhart, as well as a junior guard in Nolan Hickman. That team had a veteran front court superstar in Kyle Wilcher. This team has Anton Watson. Don't get it twisted. Those two players are very different in terms of their strengths and weaknesses, but it is kind of fit the veteran star player on the team. Uh, the Zags this year kind of need somebody to pop the way DeMontis Sabonis did. Ben Gregg and Braden Huff and Steel Venters, June Sakio, whomever, they're not going to pop the way Sabonis did statistically. I just don't think that's likely to happen. But I do think that that's kind of an area that these, these rosters don't quite line up exactly. Uh, but that team also lacked depth, uh, especially experienced depth. Kyle Grand Guinness came off the bench. He was a depth option for them. He's kind of similar to Steel Venters in that way, although I, I don't think Steel's going to come off the bench. But outside of that, they had Brian Alberts, who was a freshman, Ryan Edwards, who were a sophomore. Those are kind of the key rotation pieces. This Zags team has very little uh, experience coming off the bench, likely only Ben Gregg, who's really played at the collegiate level before. So there's a lot of similarities between those two rosters. I think this roster is, is less likely to struggle in WCC play as that roster did. Uh, but I think that there are some vague similarities in terms of having to replace key backcourt starters and having some injury prone guys and, and, and et cetera for, for these two teams. Final question here in the second segment. This is another one here from Heartland Zag on, on Discord, excuse me, who says, hypothetically, if Hunter and Efton ball out and Nolan and Ben struggle, how will that impact Gonzaga as a potential destination for recruits and transfers? Almost not at all, to be perfectly honest. Not at all. I don't think players would be making decisions based on how Nolan Hickman played. I don't think players are going to make decisions based on how Hunter Salas played. I just don't think it's something that fans worry about a lot. Fans talk about a lot. And I just don't think that it's how it's, it's not how recruiting is going. Like players wouldn't not transfer to Gonzaga because Hunter Salas did well at Wake Forest. Like those things are not mutually exclusive. They're not things that I think are particularly related to each other. For Gonzaga specifically, how their transfers do matters more. If all three of Gonzaga's big name transfers really bomb this year, maybe, maybe that makes an impact on future players. But even then, I don't think it's going to be a big deal. Te teams are not, players are not looking at these things on a granular one-to-one -one basis. If Nolan Hickman doesn't continue to develop, he would be one of the only five-star players that has ever come to Gonzaga to not play well. You know, Chet Holmgren was, as advertised, drafted in the same spot you'd expect him to. Same with Jalen Suggs. Zach Collins was a one and done. Like Hunter Salas is the only other one. And if he plays well at Wake Forest, it, it might look bad for, I think Gonzaga fans might think it looks bad, but I don't, I think it's going to prove like, hey, he's still a really talented guy. He just never got that playing time at Gonzaga. It might be like, oh, Mark Few should have played him more. 
but I don't think people are going to assume that that's a development issue for Gonzaga when you consider that Gonzaga's development has been so good for 20 years. One player popping at a different school is not going to change that mentality, that belief, that thought process that agents and recruits and high school coaches and everybody else has about Gonzaga. So I don't think in this scenario where Salas and Efton pop off and Ben and Nolan struggle, which seems unlikely, I don't think it's going to change virtually anybody's perception of Gonzaga as a, a recruit or transfer destination in the future. Well, we got discussion on conference realignment and NIL to close out today's show. But first, folks, now is time for your game changer of the week brought to you by the Athletic Brewing Company. Much like Chet Holmgren's monster first half performance in an earlier this week NBA preseason game, Athletic Brewing has completely changed the non-alcoholic beer game. They make non-alcoholic beers that actually taste good. And speaking of good, Chet Holmgren got the best of rookie Victor Wembignana in a Thunder Spurs preseason game last week, showcasing why he is a legitimate NBA superstar. Athletic Brewing Company has completely changed the non-alcoholic beer game. They make non-alcoholic beers that actually taste good. They are full flavor and well-crafted, just like a full strength of beer. You can find Athletic Brewing Company's non-alcoholic brews at a store near you, or you can buy them online at athleticbrewing.com. First-time customers can use promo code Locked On to get 15% off your first online order. That's code Locked On at checkout for 15% off at athleticbrewing.com. Exclusions and con conditions apply. Athletic Brewing Company, fit for all times. All right, folks, closing out the show today with more Listener submitted questions for Mailbag Monday, one of our final Mailbag Mondays before the college basketball season gets underway. This question here comes from Jeff via Gmail. Jeff said, did you get anything out of the WCC Mountain West Combo Media Days? The two conferences did not seem to do much other than share the same hotel complex at the same time. That did seem to result in a larger media presence. Yeah, that's pretty much it. There was never really an expectation that this was going to be an announcement. I know I talked about it a little bit on the podcast of like, oh, what could it be? But like, that was never really the plan. It was just, let's do this at the same time instead of competing for, for media availability, instead of competing for uh, promotion and everything like that, we'll do it at the same time. All the Mountain West folks will be here. All the WCC people will be here. We can have more media presence, more you know reach, more expansion, all that good stuff. That was it. I think that was the extent of it. And I think considering how it went, they'll probably continue to do this uh, as long as it makes sense going forward. Next question here comes from Wade on Discord. Wade says, if you could choose one NIL activation for each player, who would it be? Yeah, I picked six players. I wasn't going to do this for every single player. Um, perhaps if there are specific players you want to know more about, we can ask that on a future mailbag. Um, but I picked some local Spokane companies that I think could work with with uh, for, for a variety of different reasons for NIL deals for certain players. Uh, starting with Ryan Nempard, I picked Clinker Dagger, one of the best restaurants in Spokane, a place that's known for their drinks, because Ryan Nempard is the straw that stirs the drink for Gonzaga. I think that could be a fun marketing campaign for him uh, should that come together. For Nolan Hickman, I picked Campfire Inland Northwest. Uh, Nolan is a very, very strong component of helping kids. He has his own charity foundation in the, port or in the um, Seattle area. And I think Campfire Northwest, uh, in the Northwest, excuse me, is a really strong charity organization that helps kids in Spokane. And I think there could be a nice partnership there. Uh, Steel Venters went with some obvious ones, Haskins Steel or Far West Steel. Whatever steel companies exist in Spokane should absolutely be making the call here and, and trying to make something work with, with Venters. For Anton Watson, I went with Flying Goat, partly because Flying Goat's my favorite restaurant in Spokane. Uh, Anton doesn't exactly fit the like, Jalen Suggs high flying goat conversation, but I, I think it could be a fun deal with with Watson to to make something out of that. Graham Ek Honey Made Graham Crackers Graham's Crackers could be a fun deal. Uh, Ek would have to really kind of be nationally recognized in order to get a deal with somebody like Honey Made, but I think there's some fun options there. And then the only non-starter, projected starter I went with here is uh, Dusty Stromer. Bellwether Brewing was my pick here. Uh, you could do a storm is coming. You could do a, a strom is coming if you wanted to. You could also do something with Dusty. Both his names are vaguely weather related. So I thought there's definitely something that could be done there. Next question here comes from Caleb. Uh, it says, is this upcoming season for Chet the most excited you've been for a Zag in the NBA? Also rank the top Zag in the NBA rookie seasons in terms of excitement. Yes. The, Chet Holmgren's rookie year is the most excited I have been for a Gonzaga rookie. Second for me personally is Zach Collins, but that's because he was on the Blazers and that that is my team. That's who I've always rooted for. So to me, that kind of carried more weight than it probably did for other people. But Chet Holmgren is going to be a star. 
And I think the situation aligns itself really well for him. He's he's on a team that already has some star power. Shea Gilgis Alexander is an MVP candidate. Josh Giddy looks great. Jalen Williams looked awesome last year. Chet is not going to have to shoulder the load. There's not this immense amount of pressure on him the way there is for somebody like Victor Wembignana or even Scoot Henderson in Portland. Chet can be more of a complimentary piece, which I think allows him to really shine. He's going to be great this year. I'm extremely excited about it. In terms of the most excitement for Zag rookie seasons historically, I wasn't around for all of them, so it's hard to know. I'm going to exclude John Stockton because I just have no idea what that might have looked like at the time. I think I'm going to rank it as follows. I'm going to start with Adam Morrison. I think Adam Morrison was the most excited anybody has been about a Gonzaga rookie in the NBA. Didn't turn out the way that many hoped, but I think that's the top one. Then I have Holmgren and Suggs right after that. Obviously, we got robbed of Holmgren's rookie year last year, but the excitement is still palatable right now. Uh, Suggs is next. Then I go Rui Four and Zach Collins at five, two other lottery picks. So I think there was a ton of excitement around. Honorable mentions for me, DeMontis Sabonis. I remember it was a bit more subdued around him. And of course, he has exceeded all of those expectations, but he's just kind of right outside. Then I have Dan Dickow, Corey Kispert, Kelly Olenek, Roni Turioff, Austin Day, basically the rest of Gonzaga's first round picks. I didn't include Brandon Clark because there wasn't a ton of excitement around him, but for the most part, I think that's kind of the next group. You know, you got Julian Strother and Andrew Nembhard in there as well. I'm sure I'm missing some guys, but that's kind of where I think the general amount of excitement has been for Gonzaga rookies uh, up to this point. Final question of the show comes from Jeff via Gmail. Jeff says, if it takes more than a couple of years for the Big 12 to work out, would the combo Pac-2 Mountain West Conference be a worthwhile option? The competition would be fantastic, but could that making that move lock Gonzaga into a grant of rights type situation that could make a Big 12 move more difficult to make? Yeah, it doesn't make sense for Gonzaga to do this. If Gonzaga's plan is to get into the Big 12, they wait in the WCC till they get into the Big 12. There's just, it would take a confluence of factors effectively the very, very real threat of a breakoff happening where if Gonzaga is not in a power conference, they are not going to be part of the new NCAA tournament. That would have to be imminent. And the Big 12 would have to be basically directly saying, we are not going to take you into our conference in, until after this happens. And then at that point, the Pac-2 Mountain West combo would have to be part of that group. All of those factors would have to line up for Gonzaga to say, fine, we'll jump into this Pac-2 Mountain West conversation, ensure that we get a piece of this new NCAA tournament. That's the only reason it would happen. Jumping from the WCC to the Mountain West Pac-2 while still waiting to get in the Big 12. First of all, I don't even think that the Pac-2 Mountain West, if they felt like Gonzaga was still eyeing the Big 12, they probably just wouldn't even take them. That was the point of making this move. I just don't see it. There's no reason for Gonzaga to leave the WCC for anything other than where they want to be long, long term. And that's the Big 12. Right, that's going to wrap us up for today here on the Locked On Zags podcast. We got more conference, or excuse me, player preview series coming your way later this week. We're going to talk about uh, every player on Gonzaga's roster, how they got to Spokane, their best and worst case scenarios for this upcoming season, as well as a realistic role and expectations in their future with the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Multiple different player previews coming later this week. We'll continue to keep you updated as we get closer and closer to the college basketball season as well. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button. If you have not done so yet, you can find it on YouTube. You can find the show wherever else you get podcasts. You can find a link to our Discord channel where we're talking Zags 24-7 in your show notes as well. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, as always, go Zags.